Now the man with all the challenges and hopefully a lot of the answers, even though he's just starting in this new position and someone that I am uh, pleased that uh, has agreed uh, to participate in the State of the Net Conference, please welcome Mr. Howard Schmidt. No problem, understand. Thank you very much, Congressman, and I very much appreciate your leadership in this area for all the years you've been doing this and look forward to visiting you up in your office as soon as possible. You know, it's interesting when the Congressman was talking about uh, the devices we have, we were sitting in the back room back there and of course I've got the, the two devices, the one with the White House, which is ultimately much more secure, and my private one, which is presumably somewhat secure, and thinking, you know, at some point, and I don't know if any of us will be around, but probably 50 to 100 years from now, or whatever time it takes to go through the physical evolutionary process that human beings go through, we will have thumbs that look like pointers. We will no longer have little round thumbs anymore because we're so used to doing everything that way. Anyway, it's a great honor for me to, to uh, be here as part of this event as my first official outside function uh, in the week that I've been at the White House, literally a week ago, about this time I was walking out of the administrative offices from picking up badges and filling out paperwork and got to uh, Chris Painter, who's just done a wonderful, wonderful job uh, in keeping things moving forward uh, after the 60-day uh, review uh, was done. Walked over to Chris and said, what do we do now? And it was just nonstop ever since. Uh, so the opportunity to, to have this one break in the action of, of the things that I've been doing, but also to recognize the importance of the caucus and, and sort of the, the theme of the state of the, the net for the internet is, is just vitally important. I think it's a good place to come out and talk about some of these things. Another point, uh, the questions that the congressman laid down, I wish I could remember the sequence. So what I would probably do uh, in lieu of the, uh, the fireside chat that we we're going to do is just sort of frame sort of the questions into a, a, a conversation, if I could, with you, which I think is the, the more important things. And I think I'll probably start out with a question I get asked most oftenly, and that's, you know, do you have the authority? Do you have the ear of the president? Uh, and is this taken seriously in the administration, uh, and when I talk about the administration, I even expand that into uh, the legislative branch, and the answer is very simply stated that's yes. You know, the president, the president has been very, very clear in designating me as his lead policy official in the area of cyberspace uh, security for the federal government. Now, when we say the federal government, of course, you know, we look at the agencies encompassed there, but I would not for a moment lose sight of the fact that we have tremendous relationships with the private sector, and when we start looking at the overall space that we're dealing with, while the, the federal government is sort of the, the, the realm that I've got to deal with, we have a very, very crucial role in making sure that the government agencies that have direct relationships with private industry are being brought to the table as well. You know, as far as the authorities and stuff, and I know there's been a lot of discussion about that, well, clearly I have the ability and have I've been able to do so far, use all the various interagency processes, from the deputy committees to the interagency uh, uh, processes of both the Na National Security Council and the Homeland Security Council. So this is, once again, it's not a, bio, uh, it's not a singular type function we're doing. Looking at ways to resolve cybersecurity issues across the government. I'd also might add, when we start looking across the spectrum in there as well, uh, that one of the things I was particularly pleased and one of the things that made me feel very good as we were discussing this position as I was coming into it, that there is a direct linkage to the National Security Staff as well as the National Economic Council. And I think that's crucial. Because one of the things that we look at when we start looking at this component, uh, we, we say, well, yeah, there's the intelligence, the defense, the law enforcement piece that sort of fall under the umbrella of the National Security Council. But clearly, when you start looking at the economic impact uh, on the global community, not just the United States, there's a key place for that. So by, buying, by being dual-hatted, having a, a relationship and a seat with the National Economic Council leadership, as well as the National Security Council, which is our report through, it gives us, I think, a much broader perspective on this and helps us do a balance. I think that's crucial, and anybody in this audience that's been, and I recognize a lot of faces here have been around for a while doing this, you recognize there's, there's no way you can look at absolutes in this space. 
Just like we don't look at absolute security, there's the same thing when it applies to the economic challenges versus the intelligence and law enforcement challenges. So as a consequence, it's important that we understand that we have a foot in both camps and utilize those two camps. The other thing, and I think this is uh, sort of falls in the part of, you know, how we like to say, I've got a great job because I get to do this. And the, this for me is one of the things, working with uh, Anish Chopra, the federal CTO, and Vivek Kundra, the CIO for the federal government. Once again, as we were going through this process, meeting with them, hearing their ideas, and, and being able to sort of figure out where our roles and responsibilities lie, it's very important to us. And it's one of the things I was tremendously impressed from the first time I met with both of them individually, is the discussion was not about security. Uh, you guys are just a problem for us. We need to uh, roll out technology at all costs. It was very deliberate, very sincere in saying, yes, we all, all three of us and many of us in this room, love the technology but the technology needs to move forward being more secure, better technology and protection of our privacy, and that's how the three of us are gonna work. Uh, and as one might imagine in the past week with all the things that have been going on from an external perspective, those gentlemen both having the time to say, listen, we're gonna sit down and start worrying, work, working out our agendas, and we've started doing that as well. So when you start looking at the authorities and the things that are necessary with it, uh, you know, those are sort of the, some of the highlights. On a more functional level, we're looking at the CIO Council, the, the group from the Inspector General's office. There's a, a wide array of government functions that are taking place that have key responsibilities in this space. And so the ability to work with them and be a part of their teams, I think, is, is, is very important as well. So let me sort of move on to what presumably might have been uh, another question, and that's the, the cyberspace pol policy review. Uh, because there's been a lot of discussion about, you know, here we've, we've got yet another one, we've done security strategies before, and sort of what different is this, uh, what is different about this, and sort of where do all these things come into play. First, we start looking at this from a risk management perspective. And I think that's one of the things that we look at from the, uh, the cybersecurity review, and how do we do an overall cyber risk reduction? And as I've said before, and I think you all recognize firsthand, there's no absolutes. We will never have 100% security and still have an open society. You know, we have to protect the privacy. We have to do the things that we need to do from a cybersecurity perspective. But basically, the risk out there are the things that we need to face. We need to manage those places. First, when we start looking at the space and the risk, we have to recognize there's threats out there that we face on a regular basis. We know there's vulnerabilities that we have to deal with that can be exploited, and also the consequences. So I just want to take a moment and address each one of those specific areas. First, in the, in this, in the area of threats. That's something that we have very, very little control over. And I think we all recognize that the threats come from a wide array of places, from clever hobbyists or professional hackers or, or people that wake up one day and say, here, let me try this and see if I can break something, and they're successful at it, all the way up to and including people that use the technology to do terrorism acts. Uh, and we've seen many, many cases in the past, not only were terrorists using the technology, but also using the technology to do funding as well. So as a consequence, we have no shortage of threat actors out there. We continue to try to identify them, to neutralize them in, in, in the legal ways that are possible, but clearly we just can't all of a sudden by, by edict say, okay, all the threats have to stop. We know that's not practical, and no, none of the laws in the world will say, you have to stop doing this and people will obey that. So for that aspect alone, we also have to recognize there's tremendous capabilities that they have. What used to be at one time, you would have to have a nation state in order to, commit, uh, to say, launch a distributed denial of service attack against systems, you used to have some pretty healthy resources. And now with the proliferation of bot networks, which is one of the things that I'm looking to figure out, how can we wind up taking those things offline once and for all and prevent them from coming up again to reduce that, that threat out there. We now see the ability for people to control those systems and have the same capabilities that 10 years ago was a nation state capability. And how do we neutralize that threat? But one of the things that gives them some level of success across the board is the fact that our vulnerabilities exist. And I've said many, many times, the very things that make us great in the internet, the technology that gives us the ability to do all the great things that we can do, also in many cases become our biggest vulnerability and our biggest Achilles heel. 
And that's the business applications that we run from whether it's an entertainment to a financial system to just things that we use just to run our day-to-day -day activity. We have built a system. And it's not by because people said, I don't care about security. And from my past experience, I've never walked into a corporation, I've never talked to an executive or a CEO and said, hey, I don't care about security, we're just going to do this. There were always business reasons why security may not be the best thing for them to do at the time. And we fully recognize now, and I think many recognize, whether it's because of a governance issue, whether it's a risk management issue, whether it's a compliance issue, they now say security has got to be part of our day-to-day -day business processes. That's the recognition that's out there now. But in the meantime, we've got to live with the systems that have been designed that have not been designed and architected to work in the high threat environment we live in today. So one of the things we need to look at is how do we reduce those vulnerabilities? How do we move the battlefield away from the end users and the consumers? And for anybody in this room that's involved in the technology world, you know how it is. You're the CIO for your family and friends. You're the one that gets the call when they have suspicious email or something doesn't work right, or the printer, there's a new operating system, they're not sure what to do with the driver. You're the one that gets the call. And that's fine in the sense of configuration and stuff. But we should not be looking to the end user, the consumers, and our employees to be sort of the, the, the policemen of the desktops, if you would, or the military that's going to protect their systems. We need to move that battlefield back away from them. And the way to do that is reduce the vulnerabilities that currently exist out there. We start looking at some of the issues when we, when we look at the software code that's out there. We are doing a better job now, and I get asked this question all the time about how are we more secure now than we were last year? Absolutely. We've got newer versions of software, the browser community, I mean, we've got many choices out there now that pay a lot of attention to the vulnerabilities and fix them quickly. That's not to suggest for a moment that, you know, we're sitting there that the most recent browser is indeed, uh, doesn't have any flaws. We continue to make those stronger. But in reality, when we identify it, we're getting a much quicker turnaround in, in remediating some of those things. So every time we use some computer systems, we know there's vulnerabilities, we know they exist. And so the second part of that is how do we wind up doing that risk management to reduce those vulnerabilities? And lastly, the consequences. And it's interesting, uh, past year or so I was, I was at a dinner in the, in the UK and there were some of the people in there from the European Union talking about as we become more dependent on ICT systems, as IT and technology becomes more part of our day-to-day -day lives, they were talking about sort of that in a futuristic tense. And I got up and made my comments and I said, I sure wish in the United States we had the ability to wait until we got to that point. We are tremendously dependent upon it now. And just even the comment that the congressman made talking about our mobile devices. You know, we now have the same power either in our purses, our pockets, wearing on our hips and our suit jackets that we had just a few years ago on a desktop. We have that same capability in a handheld now. So as a consequence, we look upon what are sort of the consequences of what we're doing? You know, we no longer say, well, I'll check email tomorrow, the next day. We have a tremendous dependency on it. So as a consequence, as our dependency grows, the impact that it has on our day-to-day -day lives is affected as well. So when we start looking at the consequences, one of the things we're looking to do through our office is, if, while we can't stop the, the threat players out there, while we can do so much to reduce vulnerabilities, we can take some steps to make sure that we have the steps in place to recover quickly from some of the things that we may have to face someday. And the other thing is, as far as our connectivity goes, and, and you know, I talk about things in sort of a personal sense, when we start looking at our critical infrastructure and the things that are now being connected to places that never in the past would ever see an IP address now are connected to things that we have access to. So when we start looking at, as we continue to bring more of those systems online, and I jokingly, and, and probably not so jokingly anymore, joke about an IP-enabled pacemaker. You know, and, and fortunately I don't need one, at least not yet, give me another six months to see what happens. <laughs> but in the meantime, if I did need one, or if anybody that has one, to have an, a wireless IP-enabled uh, pacemaker that has a little pop-up on a, on a physician's window that says, oh, by the way, you know, something's not quite right here. And the doctor can sit there and say, oh, I'll give an extra half a volt here and sort of, you know, refresh the, uh, the heartbeat there. I would love to see that capability exist. 
On the same token, I hate to see someone in a, in a foreign country going, okay, well, let's see how we can make this person really go, move fast or just have them drop on the floor. And while, you know, it, right now it's funny, you look at the internet connectivity and look at the future, those sort of capabilities are becoming very close to being uh, rolled out on a, on a popular basis now. So when we start looking at the impact, we have to take that place into, into account as well. Now, next thing sort of uh, that comes up oftentimes and, and was one of the discussions that Congressman and I were going to have is sort of about the weak link in the chain. And I think all of us fully recognize that basically we do have a lot of uh, weak links in the chain. That while we can be very secure, and, and I'm the first to admit, we are doing a very good job in making sure the machine runs flawlessly in many, many uh, avenues. You know, I, I liken it to the, the morning traffic report. We hear about the accidents out on 95, 395, and the blockages here, and the bridge is this and that. But no one ever talks about that, you know, 1.7 well, million people successfully made it to work today. And the same thing takes place in the cybersecurity world. We hear about the hacks. We hear about the data thefts. We hear about all the things that we deal with. But what we don't see on the headline was, yes, we had $375 trillion worth of transactions successfully go through the financial systems in the past year. We don't hear about those things. So as a consequence, when we start looking at, you know, shoring up these systems and, and what are the risks and, and what are the sort of the weak links in the chain, clearly they exist. And we have to look to fix them. And one of the things specifically that we're looking at is that whole supply chain component. Because at one point, the supply chain and the connectivity supply chain partners was relatively small. But that's changed dramatically. Not only do we have direct connectivity with our supply chain partners, the use of their IC systems affect the way we do things. And not only that, but they're not just connected to us in one business. I mean, it's like a spider web. I mean, truly, if you draw a picture of the internet, you can see all the supply chain partners. So we need to make sure that the small, medium-sized businesses, the backbone of our uh, workforce in America today, that they basically have the resources, that they don't uh, have to go out there and fight the same battles we do at the larger enterprise and the government level on a day-to-day -day basis. So when we start looking at this, part of that part of the uh, component we have to deal with is, is the education piece. And I'm, I've met with local business groups over my career, and it's really interesting because seeing some of the entrepreneurs are out there and struggling just to get their product out the door or to be successful in it, and we know how many, you know, there's all kinds of statistics out there about how small businesses fail within a certain time frame. And, there's, and, and that's just sort of the cycle of entrepreneurship in businesses. But we should not be in a position where they fail because of cybersecurity issues. They should not have to spend half of their development budget just trying to secure things. It should be something that's built in from the very beginning. They should not have to be worried about, and I've seen it happen firsthand, as a local uh, uh, office that sells eyeglasses and those things, to get a letter from them saying, I'm sorry, you don't know what happened. Somebody broke in our system, stole your credit card number, your eye prescription, which who wants that, by the way, uh, and all the other things that we have to deal with from a privacy perspective just because they didn't know how to do it, or because it cost them something they couldn't afford to do. So by providing them the tools and the knowledge and the awareness that they can better protect their systems obviously makes all of us better, all the way through the supply chain as well as us as consumers and end users. And I don't want to forget management. And I think, I think back over my career as, as a young person, and of course I think any of us recognize at some point we might have had something less than uh, very happy to say about a manager that we've worked with. Just seems to be the, the experience that I've had. But they have to be fully cognizant of the role of technology and IT in the way we do our businesses. And so once management starts to understand it, le senior leadership understands it, and then we have a full 360 degree understanding of the things that we're dealing with from a, from a risk management and a supply chain partner. So what are some of the things now when we start talking about all the things that, uh, you know, that have gone in the past and sort of where we are today? Well, the President's been very clear, and if, if you have not seen it, one of the things that I was very excited about when we did the announcement of uh, my rollout in the White House, we did it the right way. We did it on the web, we did it on, on a blog, and we did it on a White House website. And I think that was very appropriate because of the use of technology and the recognition of that. 
And as I've said in that video, if, you, if you've not seen it, basically the, the President's asked me to focus on some specific priority areas. One, update our strategy uh, to secure America's networks. And sort of my perspective saying, okay, updating the strategy also includes making sure that we translate the strategy from the high-level points that we see in any strategy to how do we execute that? How do we translate a vision and a strategic direction into something that we find is actionable? And I think as I've met with some of the government agencies that are they're probably in here uh, today the past week or so, there is tremendous motivation out there to move from a strategic direction to how do we execute? How do we get these things done? How do we become more secure? How do we become better at deterrence? How do we get better at identity management? And what are the steps that we need to get there? And many of them have got plans in place that now they're moving forward on. And on that one point also, I want to reiterate a comment I made earlier about Chris and the folks in, in my office, but not only that, but the people out in the agencies. There's sort of this been perspective that's sort of while we're, we're filling this, this position here that things just aren't being done, and that couldn't be farther from the truth. There's been tremendous progress, and you'll see some reports coming out before too long from some of the agencies on the progress that they've made on their areas of responsibilities. And as I've gotten briefings in the past couple of days about that, I was not surprised to see the progress as continued as, as I thought it was. And people over the time have asked, what about government, what are they doing? They're doing an awful lot. Unfortunately, once again, it's like the traffic wreck. It doesn't show up on the front page of here's all the good stuff that's taking place. Here's the work we're doing in the privacy realm. Here's the, wor here's the work we're doing in the technology development world. Here's the stuff we're doing in research. And it's one of my hopes to be able to make that more visible to people, to true recognition of the work that's being done from the Hill to the, the folks out in the government agencies out there. So developing that strategy is one of the things. Also looking at a organized, unified response to attacks on our systems. And that's not to suggest for a moment that there is not a, a plan out there, that people don't have it, but we want to make sure it's unified. We want to make sure that we're leveraging the skills and capabilities of every U.S. government agency and our private sector partners. And we've seen in many, many cases that not just the government side has the visibility in some of these things. We've seen Private sector entities come in and say, listen, we're seeing this activity, we've seen it, or we get hit by this, and start marshalling our forces together so we can make sure that the private sector is working with the government and vice versa. So the President's desire to have a unified response to future cybersecurity incidents involving both the government and private sector is one of the other things he's asked me to do. And then we start looking at the private-public partnerships, and of course it's easy for us in this room to discuss that because many of us have been a part of it. But we also want to make sure that we include to the, to the highest level our international partners. Because as we know, packets don't stop at a border that says, I'm sorry, you need a visa to go any further than here with this packet of, or email or something. Clearly this is an international spectrum. And we have a tremendous international support, not only for what we're doing, but some of the things they're doing as well that's going to strengthen the, strengthen the global uh, security from the internet. We also need to look at the R&D components of this. Uh, and as I mentioned a few minutes ago, when we start looking at about the great work that's been done up to now, we need to start looking at a number of years in the future. As we're doing more to roll out IPv6 through defense and a lot of the government agencies, where are we going to be 10 years from now? What are the technologies? What are the management uh, tools that we're going to need? What are the identity tools that we're going to be using? And so investing in, in research and development is key, and it's one of the other things that have been asked to take a look at. And of course, the last thing, and probably something that uh, if there's anything that we ask your support on and to work with, and that's creating a national campaign to promote cybersecurity awareness and education. So there's their key issue for that. And there's a lot of things that we can do it all the way from, once again, from the chief executive level down to and including the end users in there. So sort of I want to uh, give a quick close. I want to maintain uh, some time for some few questions. And I know we're on a, on a tight schedule. And that's basically, uh, I want to touch on one thing that I think should never, ever be lost in our discussion as a discussion about privacy. And one of the things as, as my involvement over the, over the years, not only in the security side, but the privacy side as well, I've said for a long time, privacy and security are two sides of the same coin. Very clearly, without security, we have no privacy. Data protection is key to the things that we're going to do. And as I was going through discussing with the leadership uh, uh, coming into this position, the discussion always, I always made sure we had a discussion about privacy. 
And I am tremendously uh, excited by the fact that everyone knew about privacy, cared about pr privacy, and not just paying the, the lip service. I'll say we take it seriously. There was a direct desire, including including a privacy person in our office, to look at the privacy aspects of cybersecurity. So I want to uh, sort of leave on that high note that there's a lot of moving parts on this. None of us have the answers. There are no silver, silver bullets, but I think we fully recognize. And one of the things I'm particularly excited about is what's different now than any other time before. We've got tremendous support from the Hill. We've got tremendous support from the government agencies, the private sector, the citizens. And I think we are now at a position, finally, to make significant long-term changes in our ability to be better security, protect privacy better, and to be more re resilient in the overall. So with that, thank you once again for this great opportunity to be here today. Thank you. I guess uh, Tim's going to be throwing the microphone around. That's uh, Alex Howard, uh, searchcompliance.com. Uh, so I just walked out of a great panel on uh, cyber warfare. And I said great because it was uh, in depth, not because it was a happy discussion. Right. Uh, and you know what's been happening in the past t two weeks in the news. Um, in your role, uh, you probably get entrusted with having to come talk to the president after seeing how something may have changed online. Um, how would you define an act of cyber warfare, and uh, how would you recommend moving to address it? What steps would you take afterwards? I, I think the, the first answer is I would not. Uh, that's a very, very comp complicated subject that we've been debating for years and years and years, and I know that's one of the things that the great legal minds that look at international law and all these other pieces are working on it now. I, I think the key issue is, is the thing we're looking at is, is bringing those forces together to get better definition on that, and indeed, is there such a thing as cyber war? Uh, because there's been a lot of use of that term, and I don't know that's always been appropriately applied in many cases. So by having clear definitions that want not only U.S. standards and U.S. law, but also international standards and law is something we're going to be working through. Very good to see you. Yes. Um, you were meeting with members in Congress last week, I understand. Yes. Uh, what do you expect Congress to what should Congress do this year in relation in related to uh, cybersecurity legislation? You know, it's interesting. There's a lot of legislation up there, and one of my reasons for, for doing that, and sort of the, the first right out the gate, was to understand what their concerns are and how some of the things that we currently uh, are discussing as far as policy matters, how they can help in that. And without getting into details, because I've not had a chance in, in the week to sit there and go through all the legislation, we've got some really smart folks that not only will look at that but advise me on it, is to make sure that they understand that we're there to help them and identify the things that we need to decide from a policy and legislative perspective that they can help on. And, and one key thing I think is really important, everyone that I've met with is extremely, extremely excited to help in this any way they can. So as we sort of gel, codify and, and, and sort of gel what some of the things out there, what our needs are, we'll continue the dialogue with them. Thanks, Eric. Hi, boss. Um, <laughs> just one question. You mentioned the privacy and security aspects of this job. Do you have any principles going in on the impact of cyber security and open government? Because I think those, that's an important piece of this. You know, you know, Jerry, you're absolutely correct. Because one of the things when you start looking at over government, which obviously we're, we're very much in favor of, you always have to balance that. And I use that term regularly, you know, between the things that our enemies could, could use against us, things that affect privacy, that, you know, we're posting things that seem to be innocuous that could lead someone to develop some information on an individual to do whatever with that individual. And that's why we have teams actually going through that data, reviewing it, making sure that the privacy protections in place uh, are there, also making sure that we're as open as possible. And I think it's going to be dynamic. I think every data set that we look at as a government aided, every data set that we generate is going to require somebody looking at it with a critical eye, making some tough calls on it, and having a dialogue and weighing the two pieces of it. Because we would never want to wind up putting us in a bad position from an international uh, terrorist perspective or some uh, you know, bad actor out there using that data against either the people or the government itself. Thanks, Jerry. Good afternoon, Howard. Rodney Peterson from Educom. Good to see you, Ron. 
Um, one of the recommendations in the White House Cyberspace Policy Review was a framework for identity management. Right. I wonder if you could talk a little more about what's happening there or what you anticipate happening with respect to identity management. Right. Yeah, it's a good question. As far as what's happening, that's one of the briefings I've got scheduled coming up. I think it's next week. Um, needless to say, when we start looking at identity management, uh, the era of user ID and passwords has been sort of long overdue to be retired. Uh, and I know in the Department of Defense with the CAC cards and uh, doing identity management with two-factor authentication is really crucial. Uh, so I'll know more next week and, and a lot of the things that are out there that currently have been published things around HSPD-12 uh, and some of the issues that the government has been looking at not only from the executive branch but also the legislative branch are been out there public and I'll learn more next week so I don't have a good answer and I'm sorry I don't other than I support it. The CC currently has a notice of proposed rulemaking on net neutrality that would give government approval for network operators to use deep packet inspection uh, as part of reasonable network management. Deep packet inspection looks at all content transmitted, including privileged and confidential legal and business communications. And to protect confidentiality, more users are going to turn to encryption. How will widespread encryption impact cybersecurity and law enforcement? Well, I think that's one of the things we look forward. Of course, many of you remember the, the clipper chip days and the debates about that. Uh, and I think when we start looking at the NPRM and the things that FCC is doing, I know not my office specifically, but the Office of Science Technology Policy is working with them on trying to see what impact, if any, that uh, uh, the cybersecurity piece comes in, in place with that. Uh, another component, of course, when we start looking at that whole debate is how do we make sure that we have priority government communications in a case of an emergency? And I know there's a lot of proposals, a lot of discussions that the White House has had with that, and I'll continue to be involved in that once we, you know, once I get my feet on the ground here next week and start looking into some of those issues specifically. Howard, uh, James Brokenshaw from the British Parliament. Good to see you, Howard. Um, one of the big challenges I was interested to note was the relationship between security and economic prosperity. Right. There's a big drive at the moment, both here in the US and also in the UK, to move data into the cloud. Now, that raises a whole host of issues on security. Right. How do you see your role fitting into that as well in the design and the actual way in which we assess the architecture that sits there to ensure that we get both the privacy and the security that I know we both want to achieve? Right. And it's, it's a wonderful question because that was one of the questions I had, one of the discussions I had with Vivek, uh, as you know, and, and anybody that's heard me talk about this before, I'm a big proponent of moving things to the cloud, but moving it right. Uh, I think we have tremendous economic benefits in doing so, but we have to make sure that we do it where we have specific agreements from a legal perspective on what it is that we're putting, where it's going to be, what are the authentication mechanisms, all the technical controls around it, as well as the international legal controls. So as I work with Vivek, who has sort of been driving that and, and a niche, my role is to make sure as we're looking at the technology components, asking the critical questions about the security and, and all that piece playing in directly. So I see a very close working relationship on that as we move more that direction. I think the second part of that, when we start looking beyond the government space, and we obviously have to do that, is we start looking at the, the private sector, and that's where we can really partner up and make sure the, the, the things that we're developing as far as what are your requirements are going to be to put things in the cloud, what things do you put in there, what things do you, what things, I'm sorry, what things do you put in there generally, what do you put in there encrypted, where is it residing at, that's where we can really develop sort of a standard, if you would, on how we operate in the cloud, both from a government and private sector perspective. Good. And I think that, I'm sorry. Two more questions. And okay. Yeah, you don't get you don't get to sit down quite yet. <laughs> um, Linda Criddle with the Safe Internet Alliance. One of the things that um, that I'd like to hear a bit about is right now the Freedom of Information Act has compelled uh, state, county, city records to be thrown online, um, and the impact that this has on consumers with the amount of information that's now available, whether it's their birth certificates. Uh, power of information, uh, attorney documents, social security numbers. I mean, there's just a horrific amount of information about consumers online that really, at least from my point of view, should not be there. And we have a government that's spending tens of millions of dollars telling people to protect their information when in many cases the government is probably the most egregious uh, breach of, of people's privacy in that way. How do you see this uh, privacy and the Freedom of Information Act, all of these things uh, aligning as we move forward. 
You know, it's, it's interesting because, I, once again, well, I'm not an expert on FOIA by any stretch of the imagination, but my experience in the states as I've traveled around has been almost the opposite. They're doing more, you know, not using social security numbers for driver's license anymore, you know, moving the licensing things with unique numbers. So there's a strong desire to do that. So there's specific provisions where they're being forced to put these things out there I'm not familiar with. But when it comes to my role, when you start looking at issues about personal information and not only the, the security components of it, but the privacy privacy as well. Obviously, I'm going to be on the side of making sure that we're doing, if, if there's a requirement to have something out there through the openness side of it, to make sure it doesn't indeed jeopardize somebody's, uh, you know, well-being and privacy information or identity theft capabilities. Thank you. Was there one more? Oh, yeah. Bruce McCulley, I'm with the Sergeant at Arms IT Security Branch. Hi, Bruce. And uh, first of all, uh, as the last question, I think I speak for all of us in wishing you the best of luck in your new role. Thank you very much. Uh, question I have is uh, the annual re uh, threat assessment reported by Director of National Intelligence Blair last February had a very scant section on cybersecurity. And I'm wondering if that reflects a lack of understanding or difficulty in, in assessing the problem or the intelligence communities not viewing it as a uh, part of the threat that they're reporting on or what. And how would you see your role as playing into this? Yeah, and it's interesting. I, I think, well, first and foremost, I would never say for a moment that there's a lack of understanding of it or a lack of uh, identifying really what it is. I think that's a very, very complex issue in my earlier comments, as I mentioned. It's really difficult to give attribution. Uh, and that's one of the things, whether it's the intelligence community or the law enforcement community, that's some of the key tenants they're working on. The folks that I've met with in the, in the past week that are assigned to this and some senior leadership in those organizations as well really get it. They're reporting up to their, their, uh, the command staff and everything else. So there's a true understanding and I think a better desire to get more into uh, outside of the, the, storm, the normal intelligence channels of the public as well, so the businesses have a better understanding. So I would guess, and I haven't seen it yet, they'll probably see more this year than you did last year. Okay. So, so with that, Mr. Schmidt, um, we wish luck. Thank you thank so you. much for, for attending, and thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.